Welcome, uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, to the final uh, session. Hope you enjoyed the debate. Um, and we're going to have some presentations now on some topical issues in international arbitration. Uh, unfortunately, as is um, a sign of, a, of the times, that um, Alina couldn't join us because she has been struck down by, by COVID. So we have um, just our three speakers, um, our uh, undiverse lineup, um, gender wise. So uh, apologies for that. Um, but we certainly, uh, I hope she's able to be listening, but we send our best wishes to Alina for a very swift recovery. Um, it's a great privilege to be back here. Um, I've been lucky enough to be invited to uh, a number of the Cambridge Arbitration Days and the really uh, great events. And I'm pleased to see some familiar faces back and also to see uh, so many students. It's always delightful to be invited back here, um, get the bus from, from the train station uh, into the centre of town and, and walk past my old college um, and bring back those good memories. So I hope uh, many of you who are studying have, have equally good memories as I had. Um, I also, of course, come back uh, being on the advisory board of the Lauterpac Centre, uh, which, is, which is just fabulous and, and what they are doing. Um, international arbitration. Obviously, keen interest. It wasn't something that was particularly topical when I was a student. I know we're going back to when the dinosaurs walked the earth. But uh, it has become so much more in the consciousness of uh, people now, not just practitioners, but um, students and academics, and a lot more study is going on and very international. Um, what we are going to uh, do today is talk about some aspects of English arbitration law, some recent developments, as I say before, quite topical, um, but from uh, a, a perspective that of international practitioners um, and then uh, extend it uh, with um, Hamid with uh, a very uh, global perspective uh, at the end, and then we'll open it up to questions. So we're going to have the three speakers, and then, then we'll open it up. Uh, to start with, uh, can I introduce uh, Mo Hack, uh, Queen's Council. He's a partner at Candy, the headline um, sponsor of this event. Uh, and uh, his title, Having Your Kebab and Eating It. And uh, the Supreme Court decisions in Anchor and Chubb, uh, Kebabji, implied choice of law and in international arbitration. So, Mo, oh, over to you. Tell us what they're about. Were they rightly decided? Always never disputes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mo, um, as a, well, so as a commercial QC at Candy. Um, thank you all for coming to the graveyard slot. I know you're all in for the drinks later on, but you know, bear, bear with us. So having your kebab and eating it, um, I'll leave you to decide whether the strap line chose the talk or whether it was the other way around. But um, in essence, what I'm going to be doing is discussing the choice of law which governs arbitration agreements. But before that, I was going to pare it down to some of the real basics. I know you all know that an arbitration agreement is a mutual agreement, it operates by consent. But the point about all of this, it's a contract. Now, what an arbitration means varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, in England, it's governed by the Arbitration Act. Section 6 defines it as an agreement to submit to arbitration present or future disputes, whether they are contractual or not. Why do people go to arbitration? Most of you here, I think, are LLM students. You're here because you think arbitration is a really good thing. Um, the reason why we go to arbitration is because um, we choose a mechanism which keeps, it, keeps a dispute private, in a sense. We don't want it all to go to the national courts unless it really has to. Um, what Lord Hoffman said in the Fiona Trust case, um, he said that the parties want those disputes decided by a tribunal which they have chosen commonly on the grounds of such matters as its neutrality, expertise, and privacy, the availability of legal services at the seat of the arbitration, and the unobtrusive efficiency of its supervisory law. Um, 
particularly in the case of international contracts, they want a quick and efficient adjudication and do not want to take the risks of delay and, in too many cases, partiality in proceedings before a national jurisdiction. Um, there's interesting overlaps between that and the debate that you've just heard previously about whether or not awards should be um, published and, uh, and the same. And I, I, I took the view in the previous debate that they shouldn't because actually the parties have chosen this mechanism and it should be for the party to decide how the awards are then treated and whether it should be published or not. Although there's a different point about whether the parties should contract out of it, but that's separately. Um, but we all agree that arbitrations are a good thing and they keep the sticky paws of the domestic judges away from at least the first instance decision. The point about agreements is that they consist of two parts. The first is the actual subject matter of the contract itself, um, which the Latin is the lex causa, if you're interested. Um, at this, that is, you know, the, the main shipping or sale of good dispute, etc., etc. But the second part of any contract is the dispute resolution, res <coughs> sorry, resolution mechanism. And for our purposes, that is the arbitration agreement or the, the lex arbitrary. Arbitrary, sorry, and they are separable as a matter of international law. What, what does that mean in practice? But what it means is that you can have, in theory, a different law which governs the main contract to the arbitration agreement. I don't know why you'd want it, but in theory, you could have French law which governs the actual contract itself, and you could have the arbitration agreement separately, if you wanted to, governed by English law. But the thing is, arbitration agreements aren't generally drawn up like that. When you have a contract, when you're um, more senior and you get to be drafting these kind of contracts, what you generally do is specify the law you want which governs the contract, so that's English law, and then you say, well, if there's a dispute, it's going to be resolved in the LCIA in London, for instance, and you leave it at that. So the, the problem with that is, and, and this is where I come on to, it, it is because it leaves open the question, what is the choice of law of the arbitration? Now, the reason why that is important is because it's got to do with policing the arbitrators. So if something goes wrong in the arbitration, errors of law, jurisdiction, you know, yada, yada, whatever, you know, we've, 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 we're going to have some talk about bias as well, what do you do with it? And where you go is the choice of the law of the arbitration. So if you choose England, for instance, then you go to England and the English courts then resolve all these issues under um, Section 67 69 of the Arbitration Act. But if you have an alternative law, as we often have in Russian cases, for instance, um, you go to um, the arbitrage in Moscow, and that brings with it a whole bunch of different problems about enforcement, etc. So it's really important to get the, the arbitral law right. So what one looks at is the seat of the arbitration, to start off with. Now, what the seat of the arbitration is is a place where the arbitration, or rather the technical place where the arbitration is going to be heard. It's not the geography. You can, you can have an arbitration heard anywhere. But if the contract says the seat is in London, then it's heard by the London institution, and it's governed by London laws, and the procedural aspects will also um, then go on to English courts. So where the agreement is silent about it, then I'm sure you're all thinking that actually the easy thing to do... Now, let me get my slides, which have all disappeared... Um, the easy thing to do is to simply choose the seat of the arbitration to be the law. Hang on, bear with me. <laughs> yeah, simples, right? You choose the seat of the arbitration to be um, the choice of law. Well, the problem with that is not so simple. And the uh, Count Orloff you see on the screen has, uh, no longer appears on TV. I think he's probably a sanctioned individual. But the, um, the, 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 the problem we have is that the English courts haven't gone down that route. So the question then becomes, what do you do if you have a situation where um, the governing law is not, rather, if the contract is silent about the law of the arbitration agreement? What happens then? Well, there are only two possibilities, realistically. The first is a law which governs the underlying contract, um, and the second is the law of the seat of the arbitration. And as I said, it makes a huge difference because you, you, some people want to end up in London, some people want to end up in Russia. Now, this absence of choice of the um, choice of arbitral law was the issue which appeared in the two cases which I'm going to talk about, in Enker and Chubb and Kababji. And in both cases, um, the party simply failed to specify what the underlying arbitral law was going to be. And these two cases appeared in quick succession in the Supreme Court, one in 2020 and one um, last October. So to rattle through them, 
Enker, first of all. Now, the facts are typically convoluted, as it happens in lots of these cases which end up in the Supreme Court. Now, Chubb, the defendant, were the insurer, um, and they insured a Russian power plant which caught fire. Um, by a series of assignments and under its rights of subrogation, it ended up suing the sub-sub-subcontractor, which was Enka, which was Turkish. Now, the contract that they um, entered into, or rather Enka entered, entered into with the main contractor, which um, was novated to Chubb, did not have any choice of law in that contract. But what it did do was say that the ICC rule should apply and the seat of the dispute was going to be in London. So the arbitral seat was going to be in London. Now, despite the existence of the arbitration clause, Chubb thought, well, actually, the best thing to do is go and start proceedings in Russia, and that's what they did. Enker, the subcontractor, naturally applied to have those dismissed. Um, the Russian court, however, said that Enker was wrong, and it did have jurisdiction to hear that, um, but it nevertheless dismissed Chubb's claim. So, you know, Chubb, having thought it was a great idea to start in Russia, actually found themselves without remedy. Now, in the same time... However, um, Enka then brought a claim in England um, to, to non-suit the Russian proceedings. And so that was heard um, by, I think, Andrew Baker, and he refused Enka's anti-suit injunction. And he said that it was for the Russian cause to decide whether Chubb's claim was governed by the arbitration agreement. Now, he also held that under the common law, well, he's held that under the common law, the underlying agreement was governed by Russian law, which had the closest connection to the contract. So basically, neither party were happy with any decision which went on here, and so everybody ended up appealing everything. Went to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal, um, Lord Justice Popwell gave the, um, the, the main judgment. He granted the anti-suit injunction on behalf of Enco. He said the Russian proceedings couldn't go ahead. And he drew a bright line here, and he said that what one looks at when the arbitration agreement does not contain a clause, you simply look at the seat, nothing else. That's the default position. Um, he gave a couple of exceptions, but that, that is really it. So you don't have to look at, worry about the close connection with the arbitration, etc., etc. You simply look at where the seat is, um, and that sorts it all out. So we all thought, fantastic, fantastic, dead easy now. We simply look at the seat, job done. Chubb, unsurprisingly, um, appealed to the Supreme Court. They weren't happy with that. And they argued um, that the correct law was Russian law, because if you looked at the contract itself, effectively it was a Russian law dispute. It's concerned a factory in Russia. The construction happened in Russia, obviously. The fact that the Turkish company made no difference at all. Why shouldn't this be a Russian um, dispute and determined by the Russian courts? Well, it went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court dismissed the appeal, but it was a split decision. It went down 3-2. Um, the leading judgments, or rather the uh, judgments in dismissing the appeal, were by Nick Hamblin, um, George Leggett and Lord Kerr agreed with them. They decided, in a convoluted way, that actually the seat was the correct choice of law, so it should be English. But they disagreed with Popperwell as to why it should be. Because Popperwell said, seat's enough, you just don't have a look at it. What... Um, Nick Hamlin and George Leggett said was that the test was, the test, new test is, you look at the law of the arbitration to see whether that has expressly or implicitly determined the law, sorry, the law of the contract to see whether that is explicitly or impliedly chosen by the parties. But if that doesn't work, so if you don't look at the law of the contract, there's nothing there, then you see what is a law which is most closely connected to the arbitration agreement. So it's the arbitration agreement where the focus is if there's nothing else written. Um, they said that when looking at the law of the arbitration agreement, the main contract law, if it's different, has no part to play in the analysis. And so they, they, they've approached the problem from a different point of view. So what they have done is said, rather than just look at the default position, which um, Popwell has said in the Court of Appeal, what they said is you don't look at that. You look at the law of the contract first to see whether or not you can infer anything as to what the meaning is. But if you can't do that, then you see the stage two what is a law which is most collect closely connected to the arbitration agreement? Again, we thought that was quite straightforward now. But what happened then? But well, then they did the analysis, and in their analysis, they actually came to the same conclusion as the Court of Appeal, because they said that actually what one looks at when looking at the law which has a closer connection is the law of the seat, which was English. 
So uh, they justified this by saying that the seat is a legal place of the performance of the arbitration. Um, the approach there is consistent with international law, which it is. Um, and that kind of rule uphold, upholds the reasonable expectations of the contracting parties who specify the seat of the arbitration without turning their minds to a governing law. Um, so, 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 so bizarrely, they have rejected the Court of Appeals decision where they've come to the same conclusion using reasoning, which in, in effect was something the Court of Appeal did. So, so I know, Mel, you, you sent me something today, and the, which was going to be published, and it's the same kind of thing. It's a really bizarre set of reasoning, but ultimately where we end up is the same position as the Court of Appeal. But if the governing law is not specified by the contract, one looks at um, the, the arbitration agreement, and effectively one looks at the seat to determine where it is. Um, so they ultimately agreed. Now, the interesting thing about that case was two very, very senior judges, um, Andrew Burroughs of this parish and um, Philip Sales, both um, dissented, uh, and they said that as the main contract was governed by Russian law, then that should be the choice um, of the law which governs the arbitration agreement. Very powerful defense, um, dissents um, from both of them. But, uh, uh, but we are where we are now, so it provides some clarity. Um, so... That is the principle that English law operates. But it doesn't mean that cases don't then continue to appear. Because after that, only a year later, buses, London buses following each other, we went to the Supreme Court again in a case called Kebabji and Kut Food Group, um, the eponymous title of my talk. Now, Kebabji are a Lebanese food manufacturer, a well-known chain. I think there's, there, there's branches in London as well. Um, the facts, again, are slightly convoluted. But in essence, Kebabji franchised their product around the world. Um, they entered into a franchise agreement with Al Hamizi. Um, Al Hamizi were then bought a few years later by the ultimate defendant, Coot. Uh, I think it was Coot PLC. Uh, it's another Kuwaiti company called Coot anyway. Um, the agreement there uh, was that the governing law was English law, but it also had an arbitration agreement that the seat of the award should be in France, um, covered by the ICC rules. Now, the arbitration then took place in France, and the interesting thing here was the party to the arbitration was not Al Hamizi, who was the party to the contract. Um, the party to the arbitration was, in fact, Coot, who had nothing to do with it. They had simply bought the company a few years later. Now, in Paris, what happened was that under French law, you could bring a claim in these circumstances against Coot. So Coot were then found to be liable in the French arbitration. They obviously reserved their position to, uh, to, uh, to dissent and argue jurisdiction and the rest of it. Uh, but as a matter of principle, the French, arbitral, um, the French um, arbitration panel find that Coot were liable to the tune of just over $6 million dollars. Now, here comes a complicated appeal process. Because what happened then was that Coote applied to the Paris Court of Appeal to set aside the award. So Coote in Paris was saying, not happy with this, I shouldn't be a party to it. Now, Kebabji, at the same time, wanted to enforce the award in London. So then brought, they then brought proceedings in London with their award. So they've come to the London Commercial Court, waving the piece of paper, saying... Well, I've got this award from the Paris arbitration from the ICC. Um, I want to enforce it, please, um, Mr. Commercial Court Judge. Uh, Coote then reacted to that with an application that that order be set aside. So you, you have here parallel proceedings. So in the French court, we have a win for, um, a win for Kebabji, and Coote is saying, well, that's completely wrong because I shouldn't, be, shouldn't even be a party to this thing under English law, so it should all be English law. So what did the commercial court in London decide? Well, it decided that the validity of the arbitration agreement was governed by English law. And as a matter of English law, Coote was not a party to the agreement or to the arbitration agreement. Now, that then went up to appeal. Um, and the uh, appeal court agreed as well. So as a matter of English law, Coote should never have been a party to this arbitration. Now, remember, in France... Kebabji have already won. Um, but the English, law say, the English court is now saying, as a matter of enforcement of the award in London, this award is unenforceable because it should never have been made. 
So this all then trotted off to the Supreme Court again last um, August with a decision coming out in October. The, the Supreme Court um, agreed. They said that the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards was governed by the New York Convention. Now, the, there's a list of grounds in the New York Convention upon which you can resist. One of those is an invalid arbitration agreement. Um, and they said that the principles were those mirroring those in ENCA, that the validity of the arbitration agreement is governed by the law the parties chose. That's stage one. Um, and stage two, where there's no laws chosen, the applicable law is that of the country where the award was made, I, the seat. So that's the New York Convention rules, which is um, the same as the common law rules. And they said that taking the approach from ENCA, a general choice of law as part of the contract will be a sufficient indication of the law to which the parties subject the contract. So what they have done is they have looked at the law of the franchise agreement and said that is, in fact, the governing law of the contract, not simply the seat. So in this case, the law of the franchise agreement was English law, and therefore English law then governed everything. And, of course, moving that through or taking the analysis through, what that means is that under English law, Coote are not a party to this agreement. So that despite the fact that Kababji have a valid award in France, the English courts are now saying that, well, this is just, it's just a waste of paper, really. You can't enforce it in London. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the decision in Paris hasn't... It's, it's being appealed. I don't know the outcome yet. I don't know if anybody else does, but it's, it's, still, it's still to be heard. So it'll be interesting to see what happens after that. So what, what does it tell us? What does Kababji tell us? Well, it reinforces, first of all, what we knew from ENCA, that um, in, in terms of the principles you look at when considering what the law of the arbitration is. Um, but secondly, what it also does is tells us that these principles apply both before the arbitration takes place, that was ENCA, but they also apply after the arbitration takes place and the award has been made, and um, that is the difference in this case. So, as I said, the English courts, and it's perfectly open to the English courts to say that if the arbitration award is invalid for the grounds of jurisdiction, um, then they will refuse to enforce it. Re um, refuse to enforce it. So what, have we, what, what are our takeaways from this? Well, the most important takeaway in all of this is that you should be very careful when drafting your contracts. <laughs> no, if, you want to, if you want X to be the choice of law, then you know, bloody well make it the choice of law. Uh, because if you don't do that, what's going to happen is that you are going to be at the mercy of any high court judge who decides what the closest connection is the, to the agreement that you have drafted. And so to try to try, tie it all in with a very bad pun, um, it is they, the judges, who will be having your kebab and eating it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, guys, for listening. <laughs>
uh, great to, to see so so many of you, some familiar faces, and being Cambridge, it, it's such a special privilege for any uh, practitioner. So I'm very happy to, to be here. And I thank you, the organizers, for, for the kind invitation. Uh, I've been following up on the debate since yesterday, and I, ha I have learned uh, a lot from, from the, the presentations. Uh, and while um, I'm very delighted to, to be here, I must uh, confess that uh, I am under a bit uh, of a pressure here. Uh, first of all, because I am a civil law lawyer, and now I'll, I'll try to, to comment one of the most important uh, Supreme Court cases uh, that, that uh, has been debated by, by so many brilliant uh, people. So uh, another um, thing that uh, puts me under a lot of pressure, it's a Saturday afternoon, the last panel. And uh, I think finally being uh, at Cambridge uh, adds certainly some, some pressure. But uh, the beauty of the international arbitration is that we, we can try at least to give some uh, a different perspectives uh, about the practice uh, of arbitration, and that's what I'm going to try to do uh, today. So I excuse myself from the very beginning if I uh, make any comment that's not so technical under English law, but uh, I, I will try to, to give a, a more international perspective about this very important case, which is Halliburton versus uh, Chubb. It's a... Um, it's, um, judgment handed down by the Supreme Court in 2020. And I would say that most of, most of you already know uh, the, this case. It has been hotly debated um, for, for a while now, but I think uh, it does have uh, a lot of importance for the practice of international uh, arbitration. And why uh, this case is so important? Because uh, it does clarify very important uh, issues in um, international, uh, international commercial arbitration. And what we are going to be discussing here today is the, the application of, of some of the duties of arbitrators to, to, to make uh, disclosures. So we are going to be talking about the issue of conflicts. And uh, that's a very important core principle uh, of arbitration, as you, you know well, uh, the principle of uh, impartiality of arbitrators is uh, probably the most important, uh, or at least one of the most important principles of um, international arbitration. And why is that so? Because, of course, uh, most of arbitration cases, they end up with a final and binding uh, decision. There's no appeal uh, against that uh, arbitral award, and therefore you want to make sure that uh, you've had a, a fair uh, case, that, that you, you must uh, be very comfortable with the, the arbitrators who are going to uh, decide that case on a, on a final and binding uh, matter. So, of course, this is, uh, therefore, a very important uh, principle of uh, arbitration. And this case of Halliburton versus Chubb deals with uh, many uh, of the issues underlying uh, the, these principles of, of uh, fair arbitration, the duty of uh, arbitrators uh, of making some, some disclosures, and, and therefore it gives not only uh, English uh, law practitioners, but um, gives a, a lot of clarification on, on the, the practice of our arbitration uh, law. And th that's why I, I think it's so important for us to, to debate uh, this case here. And just for you to have a, a, an idea of the importance of this case, uh, there have been uh, five interveners uh, in this uh, case, including the ICC, the LCIA, the Charter Institute of Ar Arbitrators, the London Maritime Arbitrators Association, and GAFTA. So many very important uh, arbitral institutions had uh, a close interest in the resolution of, of this case. Because at the end of the day, it, it was the seat of London that was really uh, in, in debate here, whether uh, London would still be uh, a very important seat for international uh, arbitrations. And um, we're going to see uh, in a while, uh, after the, the Court of Appeal decision, many leading firms worldwide issue uh, some... some uh, letters to, to the clients saying that uh, they were very 
uh, worried about the decision of the Court of Appeals and that, that this could uh, mean that London would no longer be so interesting for uh, commercial arbitrations and people or companies should even uh, consider changing uh, the, their contracts to, to change the, the seat of arbitration. So uh, this ha has been uh, a case closely uh, watched by, by the, um, all arbitration practitioners worldwide. So uh, I'm going to try to give you some of the background of the case. Uh, I'll try to give you really a very short summary of the case because it's, uh, the decision gives a lot of the details. But uh, I think for, for our purpose here, what we, we need to, to know that uh, this case arises out of uh, a Bermuda form liability policy. The, this issue has been debated on some of our panels uh, of the event. And there was an explosion uh, of a drilling rig in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Then, uh, following the dri drilling uh, rigs blowout, uh, some, some companies, including Halliburton, were the subject of uh, some litigation in the US. And uh, after uh, that, Halliburton and Transocean, the other company involved in this accident, they settled that the claims brought against them and subsequently claimed Chubb under the Bermuda form policy. So they, they settled, they pay a lot of money, and they went after Chubb for claiming uh, this money they had paid uh, under the, the settlements. Uh, Chubb refused coverage under the, the, the policy, and then Halliburton and Transocean initiated ad hoc uh, arbitration proceedings against Chubb. Uh, I will emphasize that it has been an ad hoc uh, arbitration. I'm, I'm going to make some comments about that specific point later on. Well, uh, still, in terms of background of the case, the, the policies arbitration clause provided for London seated uh, arbitration by a tribunal of three arbitrators, one appointed uh, by each party, and the third by the two arbitrators so chosen. As the party appointed arbitrators were uh, unable to agree on the third arbitrator's name, the High Court of Justice in London uh, made the appointment. The chairman's uh, appointment was contested by Halliburton on the grounds that he had been repeatedly appointed by Chubb and previously act acted on several arbitrations involving Chubb. Nevertheless, the chairman's appointment was confirmed by the High Court. And following uh, his appointment uh, in Halliburton, the chairman was appointed by Chubb in the arbitration against uh, Transocean. While the chairman disclosed uh, his participation in the Halliburton proceedings through Transocean, uh, he did not disclose his new appointment to Halliburton. Uh, and in addition to that, the, the chairman was appointed in another arbitration related to the Deepwater Horizon incident and did not disclose it to Halliburton. So we are dealing here with repeated appointments by uh, the same party involving the same uh, accident. So the, that's the, the, the summary of the, the, the case in terms of facts. What happened is that Halliburton's then discovered uh, the chairman's appointment in the other proceedings and raised uh, concerns regarding the chairman's impartiality. Uh, chairman, here's a very interesting point of the case, that the chairman contended that no damage had been done for his oversight and offered to tender his resignation. So uh, while he said uh, he acknowledged that he didn't make the, the disclosure, he said that indeed he could have made it because at some point he uh, acknowledged that the parties uh, might want the to have that uh, information and therefore he offered to tender his resignation. Although requested by Halliburton, uh, the, the resignation of the, the, the chairman, uh, he did not resign uh, due to an objection from Chubb. So Chubb said, no, uh, I want the, the arbitral proceedings to, to, to go forward, and I don't accept uh, the chair to, um, uh, to resign for, from his appointment because they, they were worried about the, the, the proceedings, the timing of the proceedings. And uh, because of that, the chair said, okay, I, I do also have an obligation with Chubb because uh, I cannot simply resign because this will cause some prejudice to, uh, 
to Chubb as well, and therefore he, he didn't uh, resign. Then Halliburton sought uh, an order from the High Court to remove the chairman from the tribunal, which was denied. The Court of Appeal maintained the, the High Court's decision, and then the Supreme Court maintained uh, the High Court's uh, decision, but uh, of course uh, giving a lot of color to, to the discussion of uh, impartiality, the duty uh, to, to disclose uh, some facts, and also one very interesting point, the issue of confidentiality. We're going to talk a bit more about that. Well, uh, the Supreme Court uh, the decision analyzed the impartiality of arbitrators according to the test of appearance of bias, according to a fair-minded and informed observer. Uh, the Supreme Court also clarified that uh, said test also applies to, to judges and arbitrators. But uh, on the other hand, the Supreme Court also made some clarification that uh, in applying the test to, to arbitrators, it's important to bear in mind uh, the differences in nature and circumstances between judicial determination of disputes and arbitral determination of those same disputes. Um, the failure, uh, also the Supreme Court, found that the failure to disclose may de demonstrate a lack of regard to the interests of the non-common party and may in certain circumstances amount to apparent bias. Here, uh, I, I would like to, to raise a few uh, issues uh, which I think are very important uh, raising from, from, from this uh, decision from the Supreme Court. Uh, first, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, the decision of Halliburton versus uh, Chubb clarifies very important points regarding the law and practice of arbitration, conferring more legal certainty. Some of the issues dealt with in the judgment are as follows. I, I'm going to just speak about some of them. I, I think the decision, the, the judgment, is a very interesting one. I, for those of you who hadn't had the, the opportunity yet to read it, I strongly recommend. Uh, it's very interesting. It's a 62-page uh, judgment with a lot of details. And uh, what uh, uh, I found very interesting, that the Supreme Court uh, did analyze a lot of uh, international materials, including the IBA um, materials, uh, the, mentioned a lot of times some institutional arbitration, uh, the UNCITRAL model law. I think the um, Supreme Court did a very, very good job in, in trying to, to assess all the implications of this uh, decision, not only for, for, for London or, or, or England, but elsewhere. So I, I think they, um, this decision is a very interesting one, and that's why I, I, I strongly recommend you to, to read it. But uh, uh, to try to, to talk about a few takeaways of this decision, first, um, the Supreme Court obviously said that the obligation of impartiality is a core principle of arbitration law. And in English law, the duty of impartiality uh, applies equally to party-appointed arbitrators and by arbitrators nominated by an arbitral institution and by the court. The court makes a very interesting analysis of, of this point, saying that some jurisdictions uh, see the party-appointed arbitrator in a different uh, light, uh, in, in the Supreme Court um, cites some, some American uh, cases, and uh, it, it does a very interesting uh, review of, of this position, of, of the nature of the party uh, appointed arbitrator. I think we have discussed this in the previous panel. It's a very interesting um, point that the decision clarifies. Also, the legal duty of disclosure, uh, which is a component uh, of the arbitrator's statutory uh, duty to act fairly and impartially. Uh, the, this legal duty does not override the arbitrator's duty of privacy and confidentiality uh, in English law. Also, the, the decision is very interesting because uh, at the same time that uh, it says it requests the arbitrators to make uh, disclosures, uh, the, the arbitrator has to be careful uh, about his confidentiality duties and obligations. He cannot simply uh, disclose a lot of information about his other or her other uh, cases. So the, the Supreme Court uh, does clarify that point, uh, which I thought was uh, very interesting. Uh, 
An arbitrator generally doesn't, does not have a duty to make inquiries on facts and circumstances that may give rise to an appearance of bias. Here, I also thought was a very interesting point uh, because um, in some jurisdictions, like in Brazil, for example, there, there have been some decisions that are imposing um, a bigger duty, uh, greater duty on arbitrators to um, try to see whether the, there is any relationship with any of the parties or, or counsel uh, in the arbitration. So um, the, the Supreme Court, of course, is, says that, that that the arbitrator doesn't have a duty to make inquiries on facts and circumstances, but at the same time says in a few circumstances, uh, that uh, depends on the case, uh, of course, on the facts uh, of the, the arbitration, but at some point, depending on, on the facts of the case, the arbitrators do have this duty to inquire. But overall, the general principle is that arbitrators don't have this duty, which is very interesting indeed. Uh, multi multiple appointments in related arbitrations may or may not be an issue depending on the practice of that particular market. So here, also very important clarification from, from the decision because the Supreme Court says, for example, arbitrations relating to, to commodities, uh, sports, for example, they, they operate in a different environment and um, this duty of disclosure may not apply in those kinds of uh, circumstances. Here, uh, just uh, for, for our uh, debate, I, after reading uh, many times this decision, I was wondering uh, whether the, the result uh, would be very different if this were institutional arbitration. Because as I mentioned at the very beginning of my presentation, this was an ad hoc case and therefore, there has been all this discussion. But uh, I, I have worked myself at, at ICC. Uh, I, I have worked on several challenges uh, that, are, that were brought to, to the ICC court in, in Paris. And, and I wonder if this had been an ICC arbitration, for example, or an LCIA arbitration, if the result would have been totally uh, different. Because uh, perhaps the, the ICC court uh, would have uh, accepted the, the challenge against the, the arbitrator. So uh, it's very interesting, just an uh, uh, observation here for you, for, for us maybe to, to, to discuss a bit more about that. And, and, and um, a final point, if I may, uh, is uh, I found some dicta on the, in the decision about the immunity of, of arbitrators. And this I found very uh, interesting indeed, because uh, as you know, that there have been many decisions, not in England, but uh, a bit everywhere, including Brazil, as I mentioned, uh, and uh, that sometimes the, the arbitrators fail to, to make uh, a disclosure, so, and they were under a duty of, of doing so. And therefore, the question that can be raised is, uh, are those arbitrators liable for not disclosing some facts which finally may lead to, to the acceptance of a challenge and eventually even to the set aside of the arbitral award. So the Supreme Court uh, said in this uh, judgment that in principle, unless the arbitrators uh, were acting in bad faith, they, they, they shouldn't be uh, liable for not making uh, disclosures, even when they were under a duty of doing so. I found that very interesting. I, I think it's perhaps good news for, for arbitrators, generally speaking, and perhaps even for uh, arbitration, uh, generally speaking. But uh, I, I wonder here uh, whether um, under the same facts here, after this decision, for example, if one arbitrator who, who didn't make the disclosure, and now it's very clear that this arbitrator had to make the disclosure, that, that was one of the findings of the, the decision. Um, after this judgment, at some point, I, I wonder if an arbitrator wouldn't be uh, fined liable, or at least that there would be a, perhaps a valid discussion about that. In, in Brazil, we have seen some, some cases, uh, a lot of cases involving uh, 
the, the lack of disclosure uh, and even the annulment of arbitral awards, but there are very few cases still uh, dealing with uh, the liability of, of arbitrators. So I think uh, he, here's uh, something for, for us to, to, to discuss. Uh, I, again, I, I found it interesting that uh, the Supreme Court said that very clearly, that in principle, unless uh, that there is bad faith, the arbitrator shouldn't be liable, but um, we'll see in the future, uh, and of course we'll depend on the, the facts of e each case, but uh, I think it's a, it's a very good point for us to, to debate. And, and finally, just, just to conclude, um, I was invited uh, during, during this week, actually last Tuesday, to, to be on a panel uh, during the Paris Arbitration Week, uh, pre precisely to discuss the modifications to the English arbitration law. I don't know if uh, some, some of you are, you know, uh, aware of that. Probably you are aware, for, sorry, but uh, I don't know if you're following up on the, the discussions. But what I found very interesting is that there are some uh, points that relate, in a way, to, to this uh, decision. For, for example, the duty of uh, disclosure the, the, during the, the whole proceedings. I, I, I heard from... Uh, Nathan, who is uh, the, the, the person charged for, from the law commission, he, he, he was mentioning that. The, the issue of confidentiality is also on the table uh, for, for discussion. And, and therefore, I, I think the, the timing uh, for discussing the Halliburton Chubb case is very uh, appropriate. That, that it would be very interesting to see a common law country, perhaps, uh, making clear a few things uh, in, in a statute, um, but I, I think this case might have a, an impact, and for, for sure we will uh, have some relevance for, for those discussions. Um, I, I think uh, if you're not following up on those discussions, I know they're uh, underway. Uh, as I mentioned, um, this uh, lawyer from the Law Commission was uh, mentioning some, some of the, the comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renato, uh, very much. Um, very interesting observations. Um, whether you think that there are any similar themes that come through on, on both uh, the cases that, that we've, uh, we've heard about, um, I, I, I don't share confidence that, that, that the landscape is, for both of them is quite as clear as, as um, one hopes one gets from the from the Court of Appeal, uh, from the uh, Supreme Court. But um, I'm sure Halliburton will be studied as we look in the Act. It's a very intriguing question as to whether, if the institutions have been hearing um, the challenges of Vice President of the LCA, I'm chair of the board now. A very interesting question. Um, having been on the ICC Court. Uh, very interesting question, and, and something that um, you mentioned about uh, when these things come to be investigated, that one needs to look at the custom and practices, and I don't know whether Ian's still here, um, but in the insurance and maritime area, they are more used to having arbitrators that are involved in string contracts or, 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 or different aspects of, of a larger transaction or different tiers of, of insurance. And, and it's out of that which really that case came, whereas um, people in other fields may, may look at that uh, slightly differently. And it was an extremely senior, extremely well-respected arbitrator um, that found himself in this position and admitted himself that he should have made disclosure, but um, he was someone that was extremely um, well thought of and no suggestion whatever that of bias, just whether there was the appearance of bias. But you may have some questions about that later. Um, now, in, in 15 or 20 minutes, um, Hamid's got the uh, rather an enviable task of uh, which I, I am very much looking forward to having thought about this to get his uh, views on enforcement of ethical standards uh, is he asks us the question gaps in the edifice question mark uh, very very interesting we had somebody that raised that at the end of the debate 
Hamid, over to you. I've known Hamid uh, when he was working in Nigeria. Um, one of the cases that uh, Charles Brown talked about where the seat was, was in Nigeria. Um, he's come over to London and, and it's great that he's working here and he's counsel with Three Crowns in London. Hamid, over to you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the graveyard slot of the graveyard session. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be talking. I was oddly introduced, and thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll be talking this afternoon about the enforcement of ethical standards and considering the gaps in, in the framework for the enforcement of those standards. To set the tone of what we're talking about, um, I would point out, for most of us practitioners of international arbitration, we have a setting foundation. Most of us would have qualified to practice in one jurisdiction or the other. I mean, the process of qualifying would have been instructed at some point on the ethical rules that would govern our practice as lawyers. We would have talked about topics such as uh, our duty to the courts, our duty to our colleagues, our duties to our clients around professionalism, candor, honesty, etc. Now, importantly also, it should have been made clear to us in the course of our qualification process that serious sanctions could attend our violation of those obligations. And perhaps more importantly for our conversation today, the procedural mechanism by which those sanctions may come to be handed down would have been made clear. So in some, in some cases, uh, you know, the, the disciplinary authority would be the courts. In some cases, there will be an independent organization. In addition to that, the mechanism, or rather the sanctions that could be imposed if there was a breach of those obligations would be clearly laid out from financial penalties to, sus to suspension of the, of the license to practice and ultimately to the, uh, to the nuclear option of revocation of the practicing license. And imbibing all of this knowledge essentially would be a key part of the process to becoming a lawyer in some jurisdiction or the other. Now when it comes to international arbitration, the ethical picture is completely different altogether. First of all, there is no one gatekeeper that administers a mandatory course of study of professional ethics for anyone who wants to become, uh, whether it's a lawyer or a layman, who wants to act as counsel in arbitral proceedings or wants to act as an arbitrator. There is no such, you know, there's no organization, there's no bar standards commission, uh, no bar association that's in charge of that. In fact, what you tend to have is that lawyers who are active in international arbitration come from a variety of legal cultures and they often have a very different sense of what constitutes proper and improper conduct. When we have conversations around ethical standards in international arbitration, we tend to talk about a number of uh, specific areas, and I'll highlight three of them. First of all is in terms of preparing witnesses for hearings. In some jurisdictions, in England for instance, there are very strict rules about what a barrister is allowed to, to do in relation to preparing a witness. There is no, you're not allowed to coach the witness, you're not allowed to essentially put him through a rehearsal of the evidence that he will give to the courts. Now that's not the same everywhere else. In, indeed, in some jurisdictions, uh, particularly in the United States, you, ha you actually have an active duty to prepare your witness for a hearing. Document production is another popular uh, topic in this area. In some jurisdictions, lawyers have a clear duty to facilitate the process of document production to ensure that the client understands his duty to produce documents and actually complies with those duties. Now, I come from a jurisdiction, as oddly mentioned, where document production wasn't even really much discussed, and much less you know, uh, rules existing in relation to the duty of a lawyer or the duty of a client. It just wasn't a thing. Now, th those are two topics that tend to be discussed and in, in which you see a lot of uh, uh, variance across jurisdictions about what the actual standards are. Now, international arbitration has come a long way from when, as Catherine Rogers famously described it in 2002, it was dwelling in an ethical no man's land. There are now several levels at which ethical standards are prescribed. So first, there are well-known and generally well-accepted soft law instruments that detail ethical standards to be applied, especially by counsel in international arbitrations. 
The most popular one in this regard would be the IBA guidelines on party, on party representation in international arbitration. Separate from soft law instruments, some arbitral institutions have also stepped in to prescribe ethical standards. And perhaps most, most famous in our, in our jurisdiction will be the LCIA, which has an annex to its rules that sets out general rules for authorized representatives of the parties. Those rules are mandatory for parties engaged in LCIA arbitrations. Now, notwithstanding these, this, uh, uh, the progress that has been made in relation to the regulation of ethical standards, there remain problems. I'll talk about two of them, and the rest of my discussion will focus on, on one, which is enforcement. First of all is what's often referred to as double deontology. And that essentially describes the phenomenon where a lawyer is regulated by legal professional ethics of, uh, sorry, by ethical rules of more than one jurisdiction. So a lawyer is qualified in, in France and qualified in England. And the laws in England, the ethical rules in England and the ethical rules in France have different provisions in relation to specific uh, aspects of legal practice. Now, this problem isn't academic. Uh, there's, there's, there's an oft-cited example of a German attorney who was practicing in England and who ended up in jail, essentially, for refusing to disclose client information that was required by the UK Proceeds of Crime Act, knowing that if he had made such disclosure, he would have been in violation of German law on confidentiality and would have been subject to disciplinary proceedings in Germany. The second problem which I will now go on to spend the balance of my, of my time on is enforcement of the ethical standards that do exist. And I would argue there are gaps in that framework and propose some ideas for how they might be filled for, for our discussion. Now, I would group the challenges with enforcement into two buckets. First of all, the limitations faced by the authorities responsible for enforcing those standards. And finally, the sanctions that are actually available to those responsible authorities. In terms of the responsible authorities for, ethical, for, for enforcement of ethical standards, there tend to be three uh, primary authorities that are considered. First of all would be arbitral tribunals, arbit then arbitral institutions, and finally, domestic courts or domestic disciplinary authorities. To deal with arbitrators uh, first, there is a general consensus that the arbitral tribunal is probably in the best position to enforce ethical standards. Typically, the misbehavior, the misconduct in question would have taken place before the arbitral tribunal. Therefore, they have the relevant information and the context uh, to enforce, uh, to make a decision as to whether the, the alleged misconduct actually goes beyond the pale. Now, but questions are, are, are rightfully asked about arbitral tribunal's authority and competence to actually carry out this role. Gary Bond has noted, for instance, that arbitrators generally lack specialized training, expertise, or experience in matters of professional responsibility. As I mentioned, there isn't an entry course, really, into becoming an arbitrator. And if there were, and indeed certain organizations, including the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, run qualification courses, uh, generally the focus isn't on how you deal with your uh, uh, your counterparts when they misbehave in, in arbitral proceedings. One other problem would be uh, tribunal dynamics. As you know, a conversation has been had earlier today about party appointment of arbitrators. Typically, you know, a question will be raised as to whether a, an arbitrator who's appointed by a particular lawyer will feel himself well placed to impose serious sanctions on that lawyer when he misbehaves. Indeed, even when you are not appointed by a particular lawyer, you, you tend to find that arbitrators are more, are more interested in getting to the substantive end of the case rather than dealing with what can be the distraction of uh, um, dealing with uh, misconduct and prescribing sanctions, uh, having submissions on that issue, and leaving aside the actual substance of the dispute. And finally, on, on this point, in relation to difficulties faced by arbitral tribunals in enforcing standards, imposing sanctions may actually create an appearance of bias on the part of the tribunal, or at least an alleged appearance of bias. And that in itself could be a springboard for other disruptions of the arbitral process. I'll cite an example from, from my practice. Um, a case, this took place about four years ago. In that case, respondents counsel uh, the, the date for the submission of the statement of defense came and went. Uh, 
the defense wasn't filed. There was no application from the respondents for extension of time. Complete silence. A week after the deadline passed, claimants asked the tribunal to, to deal with this issue. The respondent then made a belated, a belated application for extension of time. And the tribunal came down very hard on the, on the respondent. I'll quote a little bit from the procedural order that rejected that application. The tribunal said that the application shows a marked lack of respect and courtesy towards the arbitral tribunal and the claimants. The respondent's request is denied, and the, and the arbitral tribunal puts the respondent on notice that the tribunal is highly unlikely to grant any further extension, and for practical purposes, respondent shall not assume that one will be granted. So very, very stern wording that one would say, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is required in a case where you have misbehavior of this nature. But then what happened? The ruling resulted in multiple challenges of the chair of the tribunal. Indeed, ultimately, the entire tribunal was challenged on the grounds of bias. Now, if like uh, today's moderator, or Audley, you know something about arbitrating in Nigeria, you would know that there, there would also have been applications for anti-arbitration injunctions to scuttle the proceedings. Eventually, we ended up having our hearing delayed by 19 months while we dealt with challenges and court applications, et cetera, which would beg the question, would the tribunal have been better served by simply granting the extension of time, leaving aside the irritation caused by the misbehavior, the, the misconduct uh, on the part of the respondents? Now, moving on to, uh, to arbitral institutions and the difficulties they face in enforcing ethical standards. Now, some have suggested that the rules of arbitral institutions should be amended so that they take a lead role in enforcing uh, ethical standards, especially when it comes to dealing with counsel. And, you know, uh, the counter argument to this typically would be that, as I mentioned earlier, um, the arbitral tribunal is likely to be more familiar than any other person with the uh, relevant misbehavior, and therefore it's, it's important that it be the one to police that conduct. But then you could respond and say, well, the fact that the arbitral institution is somewhat <coughs> removed from the ethical misconduct might actually make it the more appropriate authority to deal with this. It will have you know, independence, uh, um, essentially no, 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 no bias one way or the other. Its interest will be in ensuring that a fair decision is made. But I would add a second problem. Not all arbitrations are institutional. And therefore, if our focus is on institutions stepping in to deal with the enforcement of medical standards, we'll be missing uh, a significant uh, um, um, area, uh, a, a significant aspect of arbitration, which is ad hoc arbitration. And in some jurisdictions, particularly in my home jurisdiction, most of the significant arbitrations actually tend to be, to be ad hoc. Indeed, in the case that you know, was mentioned earlier coming out of Nigeria, um, that, that's a case that related to deep offshore production sharing contracts. I'm aware of at least seven decisions coming, uh, sorry, seven arbitral proceedings arising under such contracts with claims running into a total of more than $10 billion. All of those cases were, were ad hoc and you know, needed someone to police ethical conduct, uh, ethical standards, because all of them uniformly faced uh, difficulties with, with guerrilla taxes from the respondents. Now, I should mention that uh, the approach taken by one institution uh, in relation to dealing with the enforcement of ethical standards, and that's the Lagos Chamber of Commerce International Arbitration Center, which in its 2016 rules expressly incorporates the International Bar Association's guidelines on party representation. It then provides that the tribunal may refer, as, uh, um, may refer misconduct, particular instances of misconduct, to the court of, the, um, of, of, of that organization for resolution. It goes further to say, importantly for our conversation, that where the lawyer whose alleged misconduct is referred to the institution, to the, to the courts, the court may decide uh, uh, that particular referral, or it may make a referral to the disciplinary authority for legal practitioners in Nigeria, um, where that lawyer is a Nigerian practitioner, or to any other disciplinary authorities in whatever, in whatever other jurisdiction the lawyer is qualified. Now that's you know, a, a quite a surprising provision. You don't see it anywhere else. And your guess is as good as mine as to why a Nigerian institution would have um, such a drastic provision. Um, clearly, it's, it's warranted in, in certain circumstances. 
I will move on to the other um, main buckets in terms of the gaps that exist in the enforcement of standards. I'm conscious that I have very little time left. And I would, and I would basically focus on what, what the sanctions that exist currently are. I mentioned earlier the soft law instruments, particularly the, particularly the IBA guidelines, and referred also to the LCIA annex. Now, what do they allow an arbitral tribunal to do if it thinks there's been serious misconduct? Essentially, um, a written reprimand may be issued to the lawyer in default, a written caution as to, as to future conduct that's contained in the IBA guidelines. The IBA guidelines then provide that any other measure may be um, uh, put in place by the tribunal. Sorry, that, that's the LCIA annex, actually. The IBA guidelines contain um, a, few more, a few more provisions, but all along the same line. Now, I would argue that these tools have their inherent weaknesses. First of all, at least in my experience, um, depending on what the context in which you are arbitrating, a written reprimand is likely to do nothing uh, to curtail serious ongoing misbehavior when counsel believes that it's in the interest of its clients to, uh, to misbehave. Uh, therefore, you, you, you sometimes need to do something more, uh, something much stronger as a tribunal. What tribunals have tended to do over time, uh, which is their primary weapon really, is to allocate costs to one party because of the dilatory conduct of the other side. But the reality is this, this really does nothing to deter counsel because you know, counsel isn't going to pay from his pocket. So assuming that you, uh, you, know, you, you, you recognize in the award these proceedings were delayed because Mr. XYZ did XYZ thing, therefore uh, XYZ costs are allocated. Well, it's no skin off the lawyer's back. Um, his clients will pay it and you know, ultimately he would have benefited from, from the delay in the proceedings which, uh, which he caused. Now I'll conclude with a few thoughts as to what might be done to fill some of these gaps. And I'll end, I'll end with, a, with a caveat as to those suggestions. The first one would be, considering the rise of guerrilla tactics with the increased use of international arbitration, the establishment of an ethical framework for arbitral proceedings should be mandatory. Now, that's automatic for the LCIA proceedings, but it's not automatic in every proceeding. And, I, and as I mentioned, significant cases do go to ad hoc arbitration where there isn't um, any regulatory umbrella. And in those cases, my recommendation would be it ought to be mandatory uh, that an ethical framework is instituted. The tribunal may, in its first procedural order, with the agreement of the parties after consultation, incorporate uh, the IBA soft law instruments or such other soft law instruments as modified for the purpose of those proceedings. <laughs> Second, I think it should be possible for arbitral, for arbitral tribunals and institutions to refer egregious cases of misconduct to appropriate disciplinary authorities. Now, I do recognize that, that this would have to be an option that's exercised only sparingly and reserved for, for only serious cases. However, I think that the, the possibility of, of that being done, being reflected in actual rules, is likely to, ref, is likely to deter counsel uh, from the most egregious um, uh, um, guerrilla tactics that we sometimes see. Finally, I would say that as an additional, as an additional tool, we should consider the more frequent use of interim cost awards. And perhaps the rules should make clear that those awards could be made against counsel rather than against uh, their clients. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the reality is that even if you make a cost award against counsel, counsel will pass it on to the client. But I don't imagine that there will be many practitioners in the world who would want a reputation for being habitually subject to such, such orders. Ultimately, uh, I, I think that there will be a deterrent effect somewhere down the line. Finally, my caveat. These, these um, uh, suggestions are very debatable. And I note that many commentators, much more erudite than myself, have, made, um, proposed, have proposed solutions to deal with these problems in the past, which, they have, later be, which have later been adjudged to be ill-considered. So I'll end by saying I'm comforted that wherever my ideas land, whether on the good side or on the bad side of the pile, I will find myself in good company. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your suggestions. Um, I imagine it engenders some, some thoughts and, and perhaps some uh, questions. It's an inevitable uh, consequence of globalization.
Um, I, a little while ago, I was doing some research on the question of civility between um, advocates, uh, and I asked the English Bar Council whether they had any rules relating to civility, uh, having uh, having trawled through the uh, the conduct rules of the bar. And I was told um, that a that a specific rule on civility uh, was not required because the English bar has a tradition of civility, uh, which is maintained through peer pressure and the ethos of the inns of court. <laughs> so I don't know whether Mo and Paul um, would necessarily uh, agree with that. Perhaps, perhaps that's correct, but we don't have that um, self-policing and a raised eyebrow over dinner at the inns. Um, at the International Arbitration Bar. So some of your suggestions are very welcome, uh, Hamid. Uh, questions from the audience? If, if I'm in the control of the... Of the yeah, uh, we, can, we can get two questions and we can move the, for the rest of them. I mean, in the... OK, so uh, why, why, there's two, there's three. Why don't, why don't you throw out all your questions? I'll just, I'll just collect the questions and maybe ask one comment... Um, to, to cover one or all. So, so the lady at the back. Um, so my question, I think, is directed to what Hamid said, which is in terms of coming up with, say, ethical guidelines or standards. Do you think that that will come up in terms of an international sort of standard that is, that is more desirable? Or do you think that is more, this is a domestic sort of concept because each bar association, each country has different standards of maybe what they consider ethical. Um, I know that there'll be a baseline, a minimum standard, but some may, may impose even stricter disclosure regulations or requirements on their lawyers and other jurisdictions. So do you think it's even is it desirable to actually look internationally or do you think it is something to be uh, sort of looked at at the domestic level? And at the same time, because when it comes to enforcement, I mean, you could then, you know, look at Article 5.2 under the New York Convention, and if there's any due process considerations, like, that could be covered there as well. Good. Thank you very much. One for Hamid. Uh, there was a question, I think, at the... Yep. Um, I have a very good question for the first presentation, uh, which law should apply to the arbitration agreement. Is it the, the law of the contract or the law of the sea? Um, one thing I couldn't help notice as a non-English lawyer is that uh, we had different courts in South America and in, in, in Enca that, that have dealt with that question and had uh, applied very different principles. They have had a wide interpretation of the doctrine of separability, a narrow interpretation. They have uh, uh, applied the uh, implied choice test, uh, the closest connection test. But the result was always the same. It was always English law. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> would it be easier to just say which law applies to the arbitration agreement? It's English law. <laughs> or, or maybe an alternative approach. Um, uh, last year, uh, late last year, Margaret Moses published an uh, essay where she said, if it's just one law, uh, actually we should look at the question more differentiated. It's not just one law that applies to the arbitration agreement. There's questions of validity questions of uh, power of attorney, as questions of uh, interpretation, and all of these questions which could be governed by different laws, so it's not just one answer. Um, I would be interested in hearing your view on that. Reminds me, I think, I think it's, it's a, 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 a yeah, 40-hour sketch to involve. Here's the menu, um, but we only have tomato, tomato soup. <laughs> um, yes. Has to be a question for Renato, though. Uh, thank you. Um, a question uh, for Renato, actually. Uh, so, Hello Open and Chum, um, it seems to me that what the, the Supreme Court has done is to favour party autonomy and the appointment of arbitrators um, and, and to give a green light to those industries that Audley spoke about earlier, where there's a select pool of arbitrators to choose from. Um, whilst that might have um, uh, some, some very, a lot of legal sense in that position, um, what do we think that that might mean for diversity in the pool of arbitrators? Um, and is that a potential consequence of the Halliburton and Chubb decision? Right. We should finish there. I see Mel's getting closer and closer to me, which I, I find slightly threatening, um, but, and, but, which I, I infer is to bring it to an end. Did you want to ask anything? or? <laughs> 
Yeah. I think I, I'm on the assumption that it will be a follow-up question. Um, so. Okay, yeah. you're right now. Yeah, I have yeah. a question regarding the same case because um, I wrote the thesis about the immunity and liability in international arbitration, which was related both to arbitrators and arbitral institutions, and it was like five years ago. Honestly, when I tried to collect the material for that, nobody really wanted to talk to me <laughs> about the issue. So I'm very happy to see that UK courts are actually coming closer and closer to this issue because it's really important. And uh, probably I'd love to ask you a very provocative but also potential question. I, I, I know and aware that it's not subject yet, but is there any place for discussion for uh, collective liability of the tribunal if one of them misbehaves? And it's not obviously too much about this, but also because following what's happening in the world and a lot of discussions about the collective liability, right, uh, is going on at the moment. So, is there any place that we could see potentially issues about? collective tribunal liability, and is there any uh, responsibility for the whole tribunal to bring it up if they know something is going on not very correctly with one of them? Okay, that, <laughs> hey, you guys got that? That's, that's next year's conference. <laughs> do you want to ask, and then we'll start, we will start. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to build on one of the questions asked to the first speaker, Mo, on um, the implied choice for arbitration agreements. I just wanted to get your perspective on, I know in both cases, the idea of the validity of the arbitration agreement and whether that should come in the initial consideration of what law we should choose, the idea of can the parties have intended to choose a law to apply to their arbitration agreement that would render that agreement invalid, and whether that, what do you think the status of that um, discussion is and whether it still bears some relevance? Okay, so show everyone your best advocacy skills. Answer the questions put to you very briefly, two sentences each, and then let's go and discuss the rest of it over a drink. Mo, are you okay to start? Yeah, sure. Um, the rest of the question that you have up there, uh, the question that you had up there is whether English law should apply everything everywhere, but of course it should. <laughs> <laughs> keep, us in, keep us in work, but no. The last few months have started there. Um, and the firm, as you all know, believe is the autonomy of the parties. Uh, and, and really, when it comes to the choice of law, the way that we avoid these issues is, is to draft it properly and have a sense of what we have to have in the very circumstances. And, and the reason why they capitalise is because you don't think how to properly the answer. So, so I suspect that it's a practical issue of the legal issue that we're talking about here. Um, how to use law more obviously, you know, you know, you know, it's up to the parties to actually specify that or not, but when they don't. Roundabout way of saying that we are here to fix problems. Um, we can create each other, we create a problem for ourselves, whether or not. And to your, to your question about the, I mean, this question is considered by both the Supreme Court, both Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, and it has its own relevance. So, you know, it signals to me. Well, I think the first question is regarding diversity. It's a very good question, Martin. That's for sure. And uh, and I, I don't really have the, the answer, but what, what I, I'm seeing in the last few years is some very serious arbitrary institutions that are making a lot of effort, effort in, in that uh, that regard. So in the ICC, or CIA, and so many other institutions uh, that are really pushing forward uh, the issue of diversity. Well, of course, they are very specific uh, niches, very specific uh, industries, but I, I think uh, should come, in my view, from the actual institution to think about uh, you know, what we could do in order to enlarge the pool of activities. But uh, it is not very easy because it's a very specific area. And, and of course, even the players insurance, insurance companies also may put uh, some pressure on the, on the institution or on the lawyers in order to think uh, out of, uh, outside the box in order to enlarge the benefits. And we've got here, first of all, I'd like to read the thesis. I 
attorneys in the subject matter uh, have been properly debated. I recommend uh, an article that is not from the article that we have on this issue. It's a very interesting one. It uh, deals with uh, this. So I think you are very serious. You can discuss, you know, the actual scenario. You really need to see it anymore from the case. I mean, it's a very important issue. Look, I'm coming to your question of collective liability. I think I was thinking here to see whether I could come up with an example. Let's think about the example of. Tribunal that would miss a deadline of issuing issue an award. In that scenario, I would claim that we would potentially discuss the liability uh, of the three or three. At the end of the day, the, the tribunal, and the tribunal missed the, the, the deadline, and there would be no this uh, ground for uh, setting aside uh, an award in many jurisdictions. Then, in that scenario, I would. Discussing that issue. And, uh, regarding the, the lack of uh, closure, I think it's more difficult to think of a scenario where we would find the three members liable for some reason. Thank you. My question as to whether you ideally you want to have ethical standards regulated by uh, domestic jurisdictions or have an international construct. I think it's an ideal world. If all the jurisdictions you know, across the world could converge on uniform ethical standards, then we wouldn't have a problem. But that's, that's not going to happen. Therefore, the ideal that's really achievable is that for any particular proceedings, there is an agreement as to what ethical standards are relevant. And importantly, no counsel for those proceedings will then be school be subject uh, to liability in some other jurisdiction by virtue of its compliance with the agreed framework of those proceedings. That's the double deontology problem I mentioned. So if you could, regardless of whether you apply a selected domestic framework or an agreed international one, as long as you are able to agree that for these proceedings this is what applies, and this one is what I think you are, you still unfortunately currently have to do with the problem that some lawyers will have uh, uh, domestic obligations which they have mentioned by agreeing to this to, to, you know, to meet the framework of the proceedings. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to the organisers. Let me thank the organisers for a wonderful conference. Thank you very much, Odlin. Thank you very much all for taking this, this task of being the grave your panel and finishing so strong this conference. Uh, we, enjoy, we don't know about you. We, we did enjoy this last two days a lot, and uh, we really thank you for coming here, especially those of you who made the trip to Cambridge. Uh, we heard from on a variety of issues, and I, but from uh, state-sponsored doping and inflatable bananas to uh, ethical standards, construction and building arbitration, uh, and the protection of investment in the EU and in, play, in, in situations of armed conflict. So I learned a lot, and that gave me a lot of food for thought and to further research and discuss some of these issues. Uh, I won't keep you from going back out for, for some drinks and to follow up and to further ask any other questions you have to the speakers or just discuss and, I mean, complete this, <laughs> uh, this event. I just, again, would like to thank a lot our sponsor that you, that, that you, that you see here and both Mel and myself have mentioned uh, our speakers and moderators for uh, doing us the honor of coming here this two, this two days. And finally, uh, I'll take just a few seconds to thank individually the members of the organizing committee, my co-convener Mel, Tim, Supana, Ishida, Shobil, Valeria, Anu, Advaya, Bhagavathi, Tiago and Taya for their tireless efforts over these last few months and especially over the last few weeks uh, to keep this conference going and for making these two days a success. Thank you.
You didn't think I would let this conference end without saying a few things. Um, I want to I want to start by saying that this this journey for me began back in uh, 2019 when I was asked to uh, do the 2020 CAD. Um, Shortly thereafter, my co-convener, uh, who's no longer around, dropped out. So I was trying to do it by myself, and I was finally getting on top of it when we had a pandemic. And over the last couple of years, the Cambridge Arbitration Society came to me and said, would you please do bring back the Cambridge Arbitration? And I kept saying, I'll do it when we can have it in person. And the reason was, as I, as I said at the beginning yesterday, or today's remarks, it's about the people, and it's about the community. And we've had so much support and so much help putting this together. It's been a challenge. This is the very first in-person conference at Cambridge since the pandemic. Uh, they're having the sixth form conference next week, but we got to be the first ones and we got special permission to have the faculty stay open to have it. So, but we had help from sponsors. We had help from a wonderful committee. There were other individuals who helped along the way. People have asked me, how did you get such great speaker panels? Because in my honest opinion, and I know I'm biased, this is the best group of speakers and moderators we've ever had at Cambridge Arbitration Day. But it's not because of me. It's because of help from, I say, help from a few of my friends. There are people like Audley Shepard here to my right who helped me get some of the speakers. There's a gentleman named John Marizad QC who helped me get some of the speakers. A friend of mine, Alex McGlynn, at the uh, Swiss Arbitration Association couldn't come because of a family health emergency. He sat on the phone and called people so we would get a couple cast arbitrators. We had help from my friend Owen Lawrence, who couldn't be here at Arbitra. So we had help from a lot of people. But that said, there's one person here who I really have to thank. You see, when they asked me to do this this year, I said, okay, but I'm going to have to get a co-convener I know I can rely on. This person has to be smart. They have to be a great organizer. They have to be able to lead people, and most of all, they have to be able to put up with me, which is probably the hardest qualification of them all. So there was a list of one person, and it was Alina. And, you know, I can't tell you how much she has put in over the last couple of weeks, how much she's been there to support me, and also, you know, today she looked at me at the beginning, she's like, this is going to go well. I'm like, it's going to go well because I have you here. I mean... We used some sport analogies yesterday, and it's like when you say you have that eraser, that one person, we were talking cricket, the old Aussies used to have the late Shane Warne, because you knew when you had Shane Warne on your team, you're going to win. We had Alina. And so I wanted to say thank you so much. Appreciate it. We've got a, some flowers for you to carry around. 